The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. In 1994, Republican majorities swept both houses of Congress for the first time since 1952. The political landscape has changed since the days when Democrats had a lock on the Congress. But have American politics now moved too far to the right? Have the political parties retreated into ideological shells at the expense of seeking solutions? To find out, Policy Watch is joined this week by E.J. Dion, Washington Post columnist, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and the author of Stand Up, Fight Back, Republican Toughs, Democratic Wimps, and the Politics of Revenge. Now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besheroff. E.J. Dion, welcome to Policy Watch. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. It's really good to have you. So, before talking about you being a Washington pundit, uh, I do want to ask about you being a foreign correspondent. Did you have a trench coat? Uh, I tried not to. I did have these special uh, running shoes where all, I wore the same running shoes every day I was in Beirut because I realized nothing had happened to me on the first day and on the second day. And so then, like a baseball player, I became very superstitious. And so it obviously worked because I'm sitting here. Now, you were in Beirut during the Troubles? Right. I, was, I used to describe myself as the cannon fodder correspondent. I had this job in Paris, and I paid for Paris by going to Beirut. I, was in, I had a job where if something was happening that was usually bad somewhere in the world, I was the person who went in, usually when they needed an extra person. So I never got to fly into Beirut because whenever I was going, the airport was getting shelled and it was shut down. So I'd always have to go in by boat from uh, Cyprus. And then whenever the ceasefire came, I had have to leave. So I had a friend whom in uh, Beirut and she once said, you know, I love to see you except I hate to see you because I know if you're here, things are really bad. Um, but it was a fascinating experience. I, the um, the late Flora Lewis, legendary uh, foreign correspondent, I will always from be grateful, the from the New York Times, she wrote, uh, she was foreign correspondent and then wrote the foreign affairs column for many years on the op-ed page, and I'll always be grateful to her, because the day before I was going to Beirut for the first time, she knew that I had never covered war in my life, and I might be, uh, you know, a little scared about that, and she took me out to dinner. Um, she said two things that I'll always remember. She said, first, this is something you will be very glad to have done. The tense was important. And then the other thing she said is stay away from television camera people. They need to get a whole lot closer than you do. Uh, and I largely did that, although I learned that, in fact, television camera people were among the most sort of if you will, compassionate people, especially toward new kids on the block, which I was in war because they were so experienced at it. So I think they may have uh, uh, saved my life or at least saved me from hurt. But I didn't go as close as they did. What year was this about? This, I was there in 83 and again in 84. I arrived the morning of the day the Israelis removed the troops from Beirut. So I got there early. I got there in the morning and, of course, get there surrounded by all these guys with huge weapons and sit down and, the, you know, talk to the Israelis. That, that night... I went up to the mountains where the Israelis were camped out, and we were around a campfire, and we knew something was in the air, and they said, don't worry, we'll let you know when we leave. And about 2 in the morning, these Israelis showed up at our hotel and said, we're leaving, uh, want to come with us and watch our withdrawal. And we went to this building that was an unfinished, there were a lot of unfinished buildings, people kind of gave up on building buildings, and we're sitting there, and these just columns of tanks and trucks are heading out of the mountains and into the south, and the mountain war between the Druze and the Christians was starting up, so you saw the muzzle flashes, the Israeli troops going south, and that was my first day uh, in Beirut. Uh, and then I went back in uh, 1984, uh, mostly when the government lost control of West Beirut, I was sent to cover uh, of East Beirut, I'm sorry, I was, of West Beirut, I was sent to cover East Beirut, which was kind of under siege at that point. I want to talk about Washington, but I have to ask you, when you saw this and compared to today and what's happening in the Middle East, what's your sense? Are, we, are the Israelis still paying for that invasion or? I think it, I mean, it turned out to be a mistake. Actually, I've, I've not written this because I still haven't worked it out well enough in my head to write it as a sort of coherent piece, but the, the similarity between Iraq and uh, Sharon's decision to, uh, the plan to invade Lebanon is very interesting because 
what's parallel here is they were two grand, bold plans. Sharon, the, the invasion of uh, Lebanon was really about a plan to reorder the Middle East, create a different kind of government uh, in Lebanon, and this would change the whole equation. I had people in Lebanon who would sit down with me very learnedly, including some, for example, Lebanese Christians who were allies of the Israelis coming in, and lay out this grand vision of the Middle East. And it, it didn't, obviously did not work out as planned. Bashir Jamal, the man who was going to be the president, got assassinated, and everything began to fall apart. And sometimes I worry about our Iraq um, invasion in the same way, that, that underlying it, whatever the stated reasons were, was this grand vision that if you change Iraq, you reorder the whole Middle East. And I worry sometimes that the uh, enterprise may be rooted in the same set of hopes and the same set of problems. Well, I would mostly like to talk to you about Washington and American politics. So if I may, uh, in 1992, you wrote a book, Why Americans Hate Politics. And um, reading it last week, I was reminded that you, your tone was of relative equanimity. Um, you complained about either or politics. So you were looking for a new center. Is that right? Yeah. The, I mean, why Americans hate politics was, in a way, a reaction to the domination of the political debate by a choice between the sort of a certain 60s left or a certain 80s right. Um, and that uh, I argued then that in the 90s, and I still believe today, the country didn't want to be stuck either in the 60s or uh, in the 80s, that American values, to use a word that's much used now in this political campaign, were a rich mix of, uh, there, were, there were certain conservative instincts and liberal uh, inclinations in the electorate. For example, I talked a lot about false choices and said that politics in our country is often framed as a series of false choices. One of the classic is, a classic says, are you uh, pro-family or are you a feminist? Well, most Americans believe in the equality of men and women uh, and wanted to honor that. They also believe in the family and believe in its role and in, in, uh, its important role as a social and personal institution for raising children. Um, most Americans didn't like a debate. I still don't think they like a debate that sort of says you've got to be one of these things or the other. And there are a whole series of, if you will, symbolic issues like that. So it was, in, in a lot of ways, an attack on symbolic politics and a defense of what you might call solutionism, uh, that the uh, purpose of politics ultimately is to solve problems and resolve disputes, not to leave the problems there and keep the disputes going. Before I ask you where that symbolic politics is coming from, and maybe we can spread the blame to journalists and cable TV and so forth. Not this show, though. Not this show. Tech, clearly not. Bill Clinton said he was adopting the third way. Was he the new center? Did you think of him as the new center that you were looking for? Right. Well, actually, Bill Clinton uh, spent a lot of time, uh, quoted that book for a long time, and he particularly sort of picked up at this idea of false choices. And yes, the answer, uh, you know, the straightforward answer to your question is yes, I do believe Clinton was looking for that uh, new style of politics. The, the third way, and we can get to what's wrong with the third way, but with the third way was very much designed in, in, uh, along the lines described in my book that what Tony Blair always said is we're not uh, the new right and we're not the old left. And I think it was very important for progressives in that period to disentangle themselves from some of the failures of their side, even as they mounted an aggressive attack on a new style of conservative politics. The problem, of course, with the third way, and that gets to the, the latest book that I wrote, is that uh, it was, in a sense, too negative, did not have a chance to get to or did not get to the next phase of politics. You know, a politics rooted in knots. I'm not for big government. I'm not for higher taxes. I'm not weak on defense. I'm not soft on traditional values. Well, a series of knots doesn't leave people with uh, any sense of how to move forward. And, and in fact, Clinton, uh, and this is a matter that wide, he's widely criticized for, his first major legislative effort was the universal health care, which, no matter how you sliced it, was going to be more of the old politics, old left liberal politics, than this third way, right? Well, see, Clinton, one of the reasons I, that, you know, the, the parts of Clinton I really did respect and think, and I think he was in many respects a successful president, um, is that he understood that he needed a balance between, if you would, being a new Democrat and being an old Democrat. The Democratic Party is essentially a coalition of the center and the left. If you cut off one of those wings, the old bird will hit the tree every time. And I think that what you saw potentially in the Clinton mix was, if you want to do universal health coverage, uh, there are only so many
many ways to do it, and ultimately it will require uh, a substantial government investment. In fact, you can argue that the Clinton plan lost also because it was neither fish nor fowl. He was using serious government money, but he was trying to do a health plan uh, within the framework of a, of the of a healthcare market as it now exists. And so he got hit from the left for not being enough like Canada, the Canadian system, for not creating a system enough like the Canadian system, and he got hit from the right for spending too much money. So in a, in a sense, yes, this was an old democratic goal going back to Harry Truman. He was trying to achieve this balance, and it didn't work out. That was also balanced off with other initiatives, uh, you know, including, um, including welfare reform, balancing the budget. Um, and so his was a, uh, you know, he was trying to achieve this balance. I think one of the tragedies of the Clinton presidency is what might this have been like absent the Monica Lewinsky wow. scale and whether you blame that on the right for going after him or on Clinton himself for creating uh, the problem, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting what-if you know, question. You wrote that in your book, and uh, I guess I did a little calendar looking, and I want to challenge you on that. Health care is 92, the, the health care debacle is... 93, 94. 93, 94. 94 is the congressional elections where the Republicans win both houses, right? Monica Lewinsky doesn't happen until after uh, Clinton's reelected. So I think many Democrats would say the failed presidency begins by losing both houses of Congress, first time in a long time. I would actually cut it up slightly differently. In fact... About two or three weeks before the Lewinsky scandal broke publicly, um, I had written a piece for the Outlook section of the Washington Post, the opinion section of the Post, and I said, uh, welcome to the third Clinton. And I argued that the first Clinton had been aggressive, but in a sense with uh, too much attitude, expected to be able to do too much. The second Clinton was almost entirely reactive to the defeat uh, in 1994, in some ways necessarily so. Um, and that the third Clinton, having won re-election, having gotten the balanced budget through in an agreement with the Republican Congress, um, he was soaring in the polls. He had an opportunity, I think, to sort of push his agenda further. For example, uh, he had some very interesting ideas to try to square the circle on the Social Security debate, where rather than cut Social Security and use money for private accounts, he proposed setting up a parallel system of private accounts that wouldn't necessarily eat into Social Security. And I think you could have had some reform around that that would have been satisfactory to liberals and seniors who didn't want to cut Social Security, but create incentives for savings, that sort of thing. Uh, when I wrote this piece, I had a sentence at the bottom of the piece saying, of course, I was trying to think, what could the Republicans do to derail Clinton? Mm -hmm. I said, of course, any one of a number of scandals could heat up again uh, and derail this whole project. My editor, trying to cut the piece for space, cut that sentence out. And I called the editor back and said, no, don't cut that sentence out. And about two weeks later, he called me back and said, good thing we didn't cut that sentence out. But I think there was a potential there. And if I can he quote a conservative point. authority on this, yeah. Paul go. Very, you know, the editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal wrote an excellent column in that around the same time, which I quoted in this Outlook piece, where the column was headlined, Beware Balanced Budget Liberalism. And what Paul argued is conservatives had a lot more to worry about now that the budget was balanced. Because as long as there was a deficit, conservatives were able to use the large deficit to check uh, liberal ambitions in other areas. And Paul noted in that column that the times when you really had large expansions of government, particularly under Lyndon Johnson, were at a time when the budget was very close to being balanced. So he thought the balanced budget was actually more of a danger to conservatism than it was to uh, liberal initiatives. Yeah. Well, to support your point, there is gossip in Washington that there was this kind of unholy alliance or promise or trade-off after the Lewinsky business broke with Clinton saying to the congressional Democrats, especially the House Democrats, no change in Social Security in return for your support, unwavering support in the impeachment business. Right. I don't ever. I've I've heard that same report. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that's a fact. I think it was more. I, I think it all had, went unstated. I think it, it was. In, in some sense, it was the other way around. That liberals turned out to be Clinton's strongest supporters in the Congress, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Clinton, being a good politician, didn't need to go and say, "I'm going to make you this deal." He just knew uh, where the votes lay. I mean, paradoxically, conservatives who went after Clinton uh, may have had the, the effect of what they did may have pushed him further to the left than where he might have gone otherwise. Now, I said your 1992 book was. Um, even-handed, 
kind of looking forward to the future, being promising. Now I read again your new book, Stand Up, Fight Back. You sound very angry in that book. Well, I think that my new book is as fair and balanced as the Fox News Network is, don't you think? Uh -huh. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> um, I think that the, it, it's true. I mean, what your, your, I, I will plead, uh, anger. <laughs> I, I will plead to that. Um, the, I, I have been very upset at the trajectory of politics, uh, since, you know, pretty much the end of the Clinton years. I truly do not think we needed to get to impeachment during, uh, the Clinton scandal. What would you have done instead? Um, a very strong uh, censure or condemnation. And then most people were willing to go with that. A lot of moderate Republicans wanted to do that. Most Democrats wanted to do that. I mean, Democrats, it, it's, it's important to remember that Democrats were very angry at Bill Clinton in that period because he caused, you know, if for no other reason, because he caused himself and his party so much trouble. And most Democrats thought this is a crazy, irresponsible thing to do. So there was real anger on the Democratic side. What actually won back the Democrats to Clinton was the very ferocity of the attack on him from the right, the decision to use this episode to push the country into the uh, crisis created by impeachment. Now, at the time, most people thought, most pundits at least, thought the Republicans were overreacting and going a bridge too far. But your book suggests that strategically, they gained by that impeachment process. Well, I think substantively, they did go too far. Politically, they gained some ground. I mean, Al Gore should have gone into the 2000 election with a lead in the polls. He should have started out on January 1st with a lead in the polls, given the state of the economy and the general contentment in the country. Instead, Al Gore was behind in some polls by 10 or 15 points at the beginning of 2000. Some of that is the hangover from impeachment, the, the demonization of uh, Clinton. Now, again, everything with Clinton is always complicated. The, you know, at the end of the Clinton term, the pardons didn't do him a lot of good and created other problems. But in, um, you know, so that I think impeachment served a political function for Republicans. And you ask why I'm upset. Uh, I'm upset because they did gain ground politically, but I think it was wrong to push the country into that kind of crisis. The other, the other thing that upsets me most is looking back at uh, the post 9-11 period. I really think that President Bush had an opportunity uh, to unite the country and I think potentially create a, an enduring Republican majority uh, had he pursued a more moderate course after 9-11. We really were unified as a country after 9-11. The president himself was, uh, for about three or four months after 9-11, was himself less aggressive. He did reach out to Democrats. I talked to a Democrat on the Hill at the time who said, you know, on these spending bills and the war resolution, this is the war resolution with Afghanistan, the Republicans could have rolled us and they didn't. Um, so you did have genuine bipartisanship and a reaching out. I mean, at the time, you know, I wrote, for example, just I'm, I'm a fairly typical person, I think, of my point of view. You now, I wrote one column praising Bush for this new sort of attitude. I wrote another column saying why it was important for progressives and liberals to support the war uh, in Afghanistan. There was great national unity. And then came 2002 and the run up to the elections uh, in 2002. Um, and I think if you want to trace this uh, anger, unease, unhappiness with President Bush, I think a lot of it comes from the use of national security issues uh, in 2002 for political purposes. And really particularly broke, in Georgia. Uh, particularly in Georgia against uh, Max Cleland, a Vietnam veteran, left three limbs in Vietnam. And he, because he disagreed with the president on one section of the Homeland Security Bill, whether uh, labor and civil service protections, union and civil service protections should be kept or not, Max Cleland was confronted with an ad in Georgia that showed a picture of Saddam Hussein and a picture of Osama bin Laden. Now, now, that's guilt by association with a vengeance against somebody who's a genuine uh, national hero. But more generally, the entire, you know, the entirety of 2002 played out as a game of whack-a-mole. You know, every time a Democrat would put his or her head up to say anything critical of Bush, a big club marked patriotism would fall right back down on their head and push him back into the hole. And so I think there was, it was the contrast between this genuine feeling of national unity and the use of some of these issues uh, in a rather narrow way, and, and I think in Max Cleland's case, a lot of people think, including me, an outrageous way, um, created again some of the very sentiments that 9-11 could have washed away. 
Um, and so, yeah, the, the tone of this book is different. It's also different because when I wrote Why Americans Hate Politics, I really did think that it was possible to create this new center, that we had political circumstances that made it possible. And I think in many ways, Clinton did succeed, where he did succeed, uh, he did succeed in creating this new center which was sort of modern in its uh, approach and progressive in its aspirations. I think politics has now again been pushed well to the right and before we even have an opportunity to talk about what might a moderate politics look like uh, from my point of view which you might disagree with I think we need to pull ourselves back uh, from this uh, movement it's not politics the right. that's moved to the right it's the it's the voters right that have been moved to the no, right. No, the voters the conservative candidates have not won a majority in the last uh, three elections and putting Florida aside you know, it's significant that, uh, you know, Gore got a plurality of the votes over Bush, you know, with Nader and Gore had a majority. The country is not a, this is not a right-wing country. No, 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 but whether it was 10 or 20 years ago, um, Democrats enjoyed, uh, a, a, if not a majority, a substantial advantage over Republicans nationwide. There were more registered Democrats, and I think there's parity now. Right, and, but you know what, I don't think that's a shift ideologically. I think what that's about is a lot of uh, white Southerners who had started voting Republican in presidential elections all the way back to Barry Goldwater uh, finally converted their actual uh, party registrations, uh, they or their children, to match what their actual politics were. And I think, you know, what's important, Newt Gingrich uh, it should not be underestimated as a serious politician. What Newt Gingrich did in 19... 94, as he essentially converted a lot of these split-ticket Southerners who vote for conservative Democrats but Republicans for president into fairly consistent Republican voters. So I don't think the country has moved to the right. I think the party system has sorted itself out in a much much into we have two more clearly ideological parties than we had 40 years ago. You, you then would not credit some of the Republican electoral success to the fact that people, especially young people, have uh, less um, reliance or trust that government can do a good job? I think if you want to talk about a historical shift, um, the shift is in the period uh, after the New Deal, government was held in very high esteem because Roosevelt is seen as having uh, done extraordinary things to deal with the Depression. We won't debate whether he ended it or not or whether it was the war, but he dealt with the Depression and then won World War II. Uh, and the government was in very high esteem from that moment all the way through the Kennedy and into the middle of the Johnson years. And then a bunch of things went wrong. Vietnam happened, Watergate happened. There was a, the beginning of uh, uh, some mistrust of government. Um, so we go through these cycles where there are moments when government is more honored than um, the, the private sector all by itself, other moments when the private sector uh, gets most public honor. I think we've been in the middle of a shift back toward respect for government's role. I think that's, for example, the significance of Enron and some of the other uh, business scandals where uh, the conclusion was, yes, the private market is good, it can do some very good things, but when it goes unchecked, when government doesn't play a role, we can get ourselves into trouble. So yes, there is that shift. Young people, though, in this election at least, uh, seem to be tilting, if anywhere, more toward Kerry uh, than toward Bush. The fascinating thing about the generation under 30 to me is how strong a service orientation uh, they have. There, is a lot, there are lots and lots of studies that show how much service work uh, this generation does. Now, for some young people, service is an alternative to politics. And an alternative to government. And an alternative to government. For others, it leads them uh, into politics and toward uh, support for government. In this, at least in this current election, whether it's simply a reaction to President Bush or something going on that's deeper in terms of reorientation politically, um, you know, the young people at the moment do not seem to be uh, moving right. In fact, I think the, the big conservative generation was in the 80s. Well, listen, the, the first of these shows had Colin Powell, and uh, he was asked the question, would he run for president? And he said the electorate wasn't ready for someone to run for president and tell them what they had to hear about entitlements, about the future of this nation, and so forth. See, I don't, I don't look at voters that way at all. I, I like the definition of, you know, if you are a small d Democrat, believing in democracy is the hunch that most of the people are right most of the time. I believe that. And I think historically, um, you know, the evidence of uh, free, you know, free societies with democratic systems uh, tend, they don't always elect the greatest governments of the world because the choices aren't always 
uh, the best possible choices, but they tend to avoid big mistakes democratic countries uh, do. Um, you know, I always like to note that Hitler never won a majority in a free election, even when he more or less controlled the polling places. Um, the, and so I, I don't have that kind of mistrust of the electorate. I think, uh, you know, on something like Social Security and Medicare, there is a mistrust that says uh, when somebody uses a word like reform, uh, it's to reform whatever benefit I think I'm entitled to out of existence. Uh, and so it is a very hard, it's a very hard debate to have. It doesn't mean it can't happen. We fixed the Social Security system, for example, a number of times. You know, we raised some taxes, we raised the retirement age. It's not like voters are totally unwilling to accept that reforms are uh, necessary. So I have more faith in the voters than that. I do worry about, you know, to go back to the argument of uh, why Americans hate politics. Symbolic cultural politics is much easier to argue about uh, than very specific solutions to particular problems. You're going to get uh, a, a bigger audience if you're talking about sort of sex, power, and money in the abstract than entitlement programs. And, um, so, and, and so I think symbolic politics and an emphasis on cultural politics uh, does have a, have a real cost. It's not that culture is unimportant, obviously, uh, but a lot of times culture is used in campaigns in more a manipulative way than in a, uh, a way designed to heal or uh, make progress. Well, on that note, E.J. Dion, thank you very much oh, for being on Policy Watch. Thank you. Come back soon. Thank you. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.